one of the Bible chapters, Bible books that I was reading was 1 Peter. And while I was reading that, God really spoke to me and blessed me. He spoke to me in particular and blessed me. And I was working on the sermon. I, wor- I had about 70, 80% of my sermon outline done. And then um, yesterday on my way to Costco, my wife and I, we were going to Costco to go shopping. And I, God just spoke to me and told me to rearrange the different things, and I was working on it. And so I, I, you know, last night and this morning, I continued to make changes. And, and again, you know, you have to be sensitive to God's spirit. And I really believe, at least I hope, that it was truly God leading me to share these words with you. Uh, today's scripture is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. Uh, let's, let us all read it together. It will be on the screen. And the version that we always use is a New Living Translation. So, so let's read it together. Ready? Let's begin. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Now, you all know I have two beautiful children, William and Faith. And you all know how much I adore them. You all know that they don't have to do much for for them to give me pleasure and joy. They just need to stand in front of me. All I need to do is just look at them for me to really enjoy their presence. I love my children. I love them to death. And it's because I love my children I will not always do what makes them happy. Did you hear what I said? Because I love them, I will not always do what makes them happy. I know that all of you parents who have children, you all agree with me with this philosophy, that as as good parents, we don't always do what makes our children happy. You You know that, you practice that. But at the same time, there's not a single parent here who does not wish for their children to be happy. Again, it's kind of ironic. We want our children to be happy, but we will not always do what makes them happy. I'm no exception. I want my children to be happy. When I pray for them at night, I always tell, I always ask God, God, please, I want my children to be happy at school. I want them to be happy with their friends. And I want them to be just happy children all around. But we don't always do what makes them happy simply because we know that making them happy is not the most important thing in their lives. The most important thing in the lives of our children, at least from parents' vantage point, is that we want them to be better people before we think about making them happy. And if we have to choose between one or the other, we will always choose the area in which they will make our children better people. If that weren't so, we would always feed our children ice cream and not vegetables. If that weren't so, we would not send them to school, but we would take them to Lotte World each and every week. If that weren't so, I would not make them practice piano or do their homework, but instead, I would let them watch television and play their Nintendo uh, every, you know, every day. We all know that seeking, we do this because we all know that seeking after temporary emotional fulfillment, in the end, it only ruins them and will make them unhappy. And because we know that, we don't always do what makes our children happy. We know that in order for them to truly experience happiness, contentment, and joy, all of those things, we need to instill in in their lives discipline, education, and morals. That's why as parents, we don't just tell our children to go play and do whatever you want. But we always teach our children to have goals, to set a goal and to follow them, follow them and work towards them. Because we know that without goals, and this is a part that I really want you to listen, because we all know, at least I hope we all know, that unless we have goals in our lives, something else will set in in our hearts. And that word is apathy. Apathy. Let me say that again. Unless there are specific purpose and goal in our lives, 
apathy sets in. What is apathy? For those of you who do not know, apathy is a state of mind where one loses motivation and passion. Think about it. And it's true. That without goals, without purpose, without objective, our lives will be apathetic. There will be no motivation. There is no passion. That is why we teach our children that life is more than just about having fun. But it's about accomplishing something that is meaningful. We all know this. What I just shared with you is nothing new. It's not a new revelation. You've heard this before. And even without having heard it from your own personal experience, you know this to be true. But here's the interesting point. Even though we all agree, even though we all know this, even though all of this is common knowledge to most of us, we all fall into the trap. We all fall into this trap of apathy. We all fall into this trap of seeking after emotional, temporary happiness, which we agree will eventually lead to apathy. And I'll tell you this, unless we're vigilant, unless we stay alert, unless we consciously fight this battle each and every day, every one of us will fall into this trap. Just like our children, the same for us. You know, there's an interesting uh, article that I read. It's a quote from a, a reverend. His name is Dallas Henry. He once wrote about apathy and how it, has set, how it sets in at church. He says, you know that there's apathy inside of a church when God's work is being neglected. You know there's apathy inside of a church when God's people are content and bored. You know that there's apathy when God's people make excuses. When God's work is neglected, when God's people are contented, and when God's people make excuses for not doing what God wants them to do, you have the unmistakable evidences of spiritual apathy. There's nothing more insidious or more destructive than the spirit of apathy. It causes depression, stifles creativity, stunts spiritual growth, and drains energy. It can take hold in every area of life where it is allowed to grow, and it can completely immobilize individual believers, families, and also church. Again, when we study the Bible, it makes it very clear that our goal in life is not the simple pursuit of emotional happiness. But instead, the Bible makes it very clear that for every one of us believers, that we should have one goal and one goal only. And that is, our goal should be holiness. Let me say that again. Our goal in life is not to be happy, because in the end we know that it will lead to apathy but rather our goal in life is to be holy. This truth is very evident throughout the Bible, but more specifically in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Let me read it to you again. It says, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, You must be holy because I am holy. Now let me make this abundantly clear. It, this does not mean that God wants us to be unhappy. That's just not true. What it means is God knows. I mean, again, God, just like a good father, there's nothing more that he would like for, them, for him to see his children happy and content. But God knows that living a life with the goal of simply to be happy does not make us happy. In fact, God knows, as we all know, that pursuit of that type of goal only leads our life to ruins. And that is why God says that our ultimate goal in life is to be holy. Well, then let me ask you this question then. What is really holy? We heard that word so many times. You know, we sing that song, holy, holy, holy. And, the, and throughout the Bible, the word holy is mentioned so many times, so often. But what does that mean? Well, let me give you a brief dis a definition, description of what holy, being holy means. The literal definition of the word holy means set apart. Now, what does it mean, set apart? That means that God has said, you are different. You will be set apart, different than the world. 
In the biblical times, when the word, the word, when the word world is used, it was in reference, not necessarily the earth, but it was reference to the sinful world. People that rejected God, people that lived their lives apart from God. And what God, and God's desire for us was that for us as Christians, God said, I want you to be set apart. I want you to be different. I, want you to be, I don't want you to be just like the world where they reject God and live you know, according to their own desire and purpose. But you, you will be different. You will be set apart. God does not want us to live in sin. He does not, he said, you, you know, he wants us to be put aside, different, apart from greed, things like lust, laziness, and so on. So there's two parts. He wants us to be separate, set apart from the world, the sinful world. He wants us to be set apart, and then now, his desire to be holy means he wants us to be like God, set apart for him. He wants us to be with God's likeness, such quality, qualities as righteousness, love, honesty, forgiveness, humility, and so on. Again, to be holy means God wants us to be different than the world and be like Christ, with Christ, with His likeness. Today I want to share with you, God has called us to be holy, but in what way, in what areas? There are three areas in which God has told us, God has throughout the Bible referred to us to be holy in three areas. First area in, in which we need to apply this is that we need to be holy in the area of of our children. What is our goal when it comes to our children? For some of the parents, their goal is to raise their children, send them off to good college. For some, it may be just to simply make them happy. But as Christians, as people of God, our goal for our children should be not just simply to be happy, but to, be make, to make them holy. Now just to give you an example, even just yesterday, uh, my son, William, he's in second grade, and uh, uh, he invited his friend to come over. And when he came over, and then uh, he was home before I was home, and, and when I came in, my children, they always know, when mommy or daddy comes in, no matter what they do, they have to stop and come and greet mommy and daddy. It's just a proper thing to do. So as usual, when I walked in, you know, William, he was watching TV with his friend, he stood up, he said, Daddy, you know, in Korean, you know, you know, did, you know, 안녕히 다녀오셨어요, you know, you know, welcome home, daddy, something like that. And but I was really kind of uh, taken back because his friend, he's only in second grade. I know that he's only a child, but he didn't even turn to look at me. He just looked at the television. And uh, for those of you who know me, I don't just let those things go by. So I told uh, him, uh, when an adult comes in, you have to stand up and you have to greet them. So he goes, oh, 안녕하세요, and so. Forth. And then, you know, you know, later on, my wife, you know, she wanted to cook for them. They were hungry. So we just came back from Costco, and we bought some pizza. So my wife, you know, heat, you know, you know heated the pizza and, and, and gave it to them. And, and another thing was that I noticed was he didn't say thank you when he received the food. Uh, but I was in the room next door. I was working. So I said, okay, I'm going to let this go. And then about an hour, hour and a half went by, and then they were leaving. And as they were leaving, I was standing right the, my study, the area that I work in, is right by the entrance. And uh, when I heard that they're leaving, I, you know, I wanted to say bye, so I stepped out of the room, which was right by the door. And this little kid, again, even though he saw me, he walked by me without turning around and just went outside. <laughs> and I was just really dumbfounded. And again, I, I've told you this before. When a child behaves that way, you know, you know which, who's the first person that we think of? It's the child's parents. Who are, this, who are the parents of this child? You know, later on, I, asked, I, told, I told this to Esther, my wife. I said, honey, do you know what happened today? This kid, I know he's young, but I've never seen this before. A kid comes in, doesn't greet, doesn't say thank you, and when he left, he didn't even say anything. And then my wife told me that, you know, his mom is so proud of him because whenever I talk to her, she always brags about how, you know, how often he gets hundreds on his assignments. And when my wife told me that, I just looked at her, so what? So what if he gets 100? You know, I want my children to be happy. 
And as a parent, just like every other parent, I am ecstatic when my children do well in school, when they perform well in piano, and when they do well in taekwondo or other sports. I am ecstatic. But I can, but I am 100%, I can honestly tell you that for me, my desire for my children is to be holy for God. My desire for my children to be holy before God is far greater than my desire for my children to do well in school. To me, it doesn't impress me one iota if my son goes to Harvard, if he has no morals, no values, and if he has no God. It is far more important to me that my son William and my daughter Faith, that they be an honest person, selfless person, giving person, and kind, rather than simply doing well in school. See, when we're raising school, our number one goal should be I'm not raising school. When we're raising our children, our number one goal should be is to make them holy before God. So there's one area in which we need to apply this to, in the area of our children. Second area in which we need to apply this is in, is in our church. Is it our church? Let me make this very clear also, that as your pastor, one of my biggest desires is for you to be happy. I mean that. When I pray for you, I always say, I want, them to make, I want this person to be happy. When I pray for you, I always desire, what can I do to make you happy as a Christian? But at the same time, at the same time, I know that planning events and doing things, doing activities just to make your lives easier, more comfortable, I know that in the end, that's not what's going to make you happy. Because as I said earlier, I know that as a pastor, if that's my goal, simply to make you happy, all I'm doing is creating a congregation, people filled with apathetic heart. In the end, it only makes us passionless zombies, which will eventually lead to very unfulfilling life, a life of regret, which also really means we'll be unhappy. So for me, my job as a pastor is that I want every one of you to live your lives with goals and with purpose so that in the end that you will not miss out on the great prize in heaven. You know, Matthew 6, 5, if you, I know that you read this passage many, many times if you're a Christian, but there's a very important principle that we oftentimes miss in this verse. Matthew 6, 5 says, it says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. They also talk about fasting. You know, when you fast, don't, you know, you know show, be evident to everyone that you're fasting. You know, if you do that, then, you know, if you get credit from people, if you get reward on earth, then you will not get reward, you will miss out. On reward in heaven. This is an important principle that many of us fail to uh, recognize or emphasize. The bottom line, this is the principle, that too often when we live our lives on earth, seeking after pleasure, seeking after earthly pleasure, Bible teaches us that you know what, the treasure that we're going to receive in heaven will be much less. I'm not talking about that, you know, if we need to be miserable, Bible doesn't say that. What Bible says is that if we seek after earthly reward, then our reward in heaven will be very little. I remember my, one of my highly, one of the pastors that I served under years ago, whom I really respect, he always said this to his congregation. My job as your pastor is, I want to make sure that every one of you, number one, that you go to heaven. But more importantly, when you do go to heaven, I want every one of you to receive the uh, as biggest, as much prize as possible from God. But too often as Christians, we fall into the trap of apathy. And some churches, they fall into this trap by giving in to the wishes and desires of the church members. And they say, you know what, uh, let's make the lives of the church members easier. 
Let's make it a little bit more comfortable without realizing as a church leader, as a pastor, what you're doing is you're taking away the opportunity for your congregation to receive the prize in heaven when you're simply trying to make it easier for them. I'm not saying that to make their lives miserable, but our goal in life as a church is not to make the lives of the church member happy or comfortable. That is not the ultimate goal. It means that as a church, we lead people to live a life of honesty and with integrity. That means that leading people to serve and to give, unlike the world, it means to lead church members and teaching them to love, to forgive, unlike the world. Lead them to be holy. And that's why as church members, I tell you, as church, as a pastor, when a pastor or church leaders come to you, and when they ask you to do certain things, when they invite, invite you to church meetings, when they invite you to attend Bible studies, when they invite you or ask you to do certain things, it is not because they're lazy. It is not. It is not because they're trying to make your lives miserable. It is not. When church leaders and pastors, when they ask you to do certain things, it is simply because they want to help you to live a life of holiness. It is simply because they want to give all of you an opportunity to receive your reward in heaven. Again, when we seek after a life of comfort and mere emotional happiness on earth, then you know what? Then you have already received your reward in full. But it's only when we seek after a life of holiness, we will receive a great prize and reward in heaven. So we need to apply the area of uh, holiness in the lives of our children, the goal of holiness in the lives of our children, and also in the life of a church. And lastly, we need to apply this in our own personal lives. What is our goal? What is your goal in life? You know, I remember the first time I met God, which was about 19 years ago when I was in, when I was in college. I remember the first time when I realized that God truly existed and that God loved me. I can't describe for you the, the gratitude, the sense of gratitude that I had in my heart for God. And I remember when I first met Jesus Christ, I made a commitment. I said, God, for as long as I live, I commit to serve you. And I made that commitment. And I tell you, I lived that commitment. It wasn't just simple you know, words. It wasn't to boast or to brag to others. But I meant it. But but amazing, not amazing, but, but things happen over time as time passes by. You get a little bit older and you get into a routine with church. The honeymoon stage with God disappears. And time passes, you graduate from college and you get a job and you get a little bit more busy. Time continues to pass and then you meet someone and you get married and you get a little more busy. And then you have children, and then your life just, there's no time for anything. And then as you get older, the passion that you have for God, the goal that you have for God, it's still there. But then slowly over time, you add to that goal. When I was a young man, really, my goal, I didn't think about college, I didn't pray about jobs, I didn't pray about family. When I was young, the only thing that I prayed about was, God, I want to serve you till the day that I die. And the years go by. There's a lot of goals that comes into your lives. And now it is more than just simply, God, I want to serve you till the day that I die. But God, I want to serve you till the day that I die. And God, please uh, make sure I have a good, stable job and income. And God, uh, I want to make sure that my children study hard and that they do well in school so they can go to school you know and God I want my wife she works hard and you know I want I don't want her to work so you know as as much and for her to rest and 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 you have additional goals and additional goals you know I'm not saying that those additional goals are a bad thing I mean we all need them but here's the danger For all of us, probably many of us, 
when we first came to know God and when we were in that first love relationship with God, we really had but one ultimate goal. Everything else was just like, God, if it happens, it happens, but this is my goal. And then as we get older and, and as what some people will say, maybe smarter, we think that, you know what, we need to be a little bit smarter and have, have additional goals. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, except that over time, those additional goals, they become the primary goals, and those things eventually take over. And what happens? We live a life of apathy. We lose motivations, and, no longer, and we no longer have passion for church and God. That is a very common story for many believers. But in times like that, we need to once again remind ourselves what God's goal is. What's God, what was God's goal for us? And what our goal was for God when we first met Him. God's goal for our lives was never to be happy. Not that He doesn't want, to, want us to be happy, but that wasn't His goal. His goal in life was to make us holy for Him. And for most of us, at one time, our goal was to honor Him and live for Him, and live for Him only. You know, I too have experienced this temptation at various points, times in my life. And really the only way for us to overcome this is to never get away from this goal and con continually remind us, remind ourselves of this goal to be holy. That means that we need to read the Bible every day. That means that we need to talk to God every day. You know, if we don't read the Bible, we are creatures that are so forgetful. It is so true. We're so forgetful that if we don't read the Bible, we forget what our goals are. And we need to be reminded. Scripture reminds us of really what our purpose and what our goal in life is. And we need to talk to God every day because it is only when we talk to God, we feel that power, we feel the strength to overcome uh, this temptation. I know lately, to be honest with you, and I've been, fading, I've been facing this temptation. And that's why I told you at the beginning of the sermon that you know, this passage when I was reading 1 Peter this week, God really spoke to me. And I realized that you know, I need to talk to God more. And nowadays, when I, just, you know, when I get up in the morning, I just talk to God for 5-10 minutes. Not a prayer request. I don't say, God, help me to have a good day. I, I, God, help me to do well or you know, pray for my wife and children. No, I just talk to God. God, it's morning. God, how are you? You know, you know what are you doing? Type of thing. I said, I said, God, you know, uh, today I need you. Uh, please help me. And, and I, you know, I can't tell you because every day it's a different conversation. But I realized that, you know, only way for me to overcome this spirit of apathy is for me to talk to God each and every day. It means for us to overcome this apathy. It means that we need to pray not only for ourselves, but we need to pray for others every day. You know, one of the greatest blessings that I have as a pastor is that I not only pray for myself, but I pray for you. And when I pray for you, I know that recently, you know, every week is different. But I know that some of your parents are old and some of you are asking me to pray for your parent who is not yet a Christian. And you want them to become, a, you know, be saved before they die. And whenever I pray for this type of thing, immediately the spirit of apathy is just immediately drawn away. See, we cannot overcome this type of apathy unless we practice this holiness each and every day. That means that not only do we pray for ourselves, but we need to practice praying for others in our lives. In order for us to overcome this apathy, it means that we need to set goals also each and every day and remind ourselves of our goal each and every day. You know, just to close, I want to share with you just a story that really, uh, that what I've been going through. You know, many of you guys know you know, for me, when I committed to being a pastor, I never, it was never about money. Uh, I don't mean to sound like I'm noble, I'm not. Uh, but just the statement, it's an obvious statement that it was never about money. It was never about pride or, or prestige. Uh, you, know, I, you know, coming from America, unlike Korean culture, in Korean culture, if you're a pastor, you get so much respect and honor and reverence. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But sometimes it can be a temptation. But in, in America, it's not like it is in Korea. So I was never really drawn into being a, in a pastor for you know, prestige or, you know, or status. 
I, I committed to being a pastor because I believe that God called me to be a pastor. But more importantly, my desire to serve Him. And that was it. And I just wanted to serve Him. But time to time, as time goes by, we're all human beings and we fall into temptation. We all fall into temptation of maybe just taking it easy. Resting a little bit. Maybe, you know, avoid the life of stress. And maybe just kind of enjoy life. Maybe just to be happy. I think this, I, I, I thought about this recently. Uh, I'm not talking about just within a month or two, but I'm talking about within about a year. And usually when I think about it is when I'm around my, my dear friend, uh, Reverend Peter Lee. You guys know him. He's a, he's a dear friend of mine. And the reason why I think about that is because my friend Peter, he and I, we went to high school together. We went to the same high school. There's a lot of things we have in common. We both grew up in Houston. Our parents know each other. We went to the same high school. Uh, we went, even though we went to a different college, we both committed our lives to God during college years. And after that, we went to the same seminary. And in fact, we even roomed together for a year, but only for a year because we got on each other's nerves so much we couldn't live together. But after that, we became friends. And even after that, we served together, not at the same church, but same area, we were both youth pastors. We always did things together. And then, you know, so our lives kind of paralleled. Until about six, seven years ago, uh, God called my friend Peter to to different area of ministry. And he ended up working for Dallas Baptist University. Now, you know, over the years, he's been promoted and is now vice president of international affairs. And, and about a year ago, he the school gave him a new assignment to come to Korea to kind of set plant a seed for future ministry for Dallas Baptist University. You know, he's in Korea and I'm in Korea. But then when I look at his life, his life is so different than mine. You know, for me, uh, you know, well, for Peter, you know, he, he, he works hard. He has a lot of things to do. But, you know, he lives in a very, very nice apartment. You know, school pays for it and it's a very nice apartment. It's like about 49 Pyeong with uh, marble floor and, uh, you know, nice furniture, you know, and, uh, and without, it goes without saying, he gets paid a lot, at least a lot more than me. You know, when, but, you know, those things really didn't bother me until one day uh, we got together and, uh, you know, my wife Esther came to me and all of a sudden she said, uh, you know, honey, let's go to France. Let's go to Paris. I said, you know, why do you want to go to Paris? Why France? And he says, oh, you know, I've never been to Europe, and I've always wanted to go to Europe, and, and so forth. I'm like, honey, it's too expensive. You know, we can't go. And it's like, she goes, ah, oh, you know. And for those of you who know, I may, I may not look like it on the outside, but, you know, I'm a, you know, <laughs> I'm a pushover on the inside. You know, whenever my wife says she wants something, in the end, I really do my best to get her for her. So, you know, I, you know, she said, you know, next year is our 10-year anniversary and maybe we can go. And then, and I'm like, I don't know where she came up with the idea of going to Paris, but, you know, maybe she saw a TV program or something like that. But then, you know, later, a few hours later, I was talking to Peter. And then he told me that, you know what, you know, I, I told her, man, Esther all of a sudden is, you know, she wants to go to Paris. And Peter goes, oh, really? Oh, man, we just went there just past, past summer. I'm like, Man, I know where she got that idea. She's been talking to my friend, Peter's wife, Helen. And then I went to Esther and I said, have you been talking to Helen? She goes like, uh-huh. Did you get the idea of going to Paris from Helen? She goes, uh-huh. And I was talking to Peter, and, and Peter, he said, you know, oh, but Paul, you know, hey, you know, I, it's not that I could afford it, but, you know, I had a business trip in, uh, in, 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 in Paris, so I decided you know, to use my knowledge and, the, you know, my school pay for hotel and food, and I just had to contribute a little bit for that. And, you know, I mean, the school paid for me and my wife, and I just paid for my kids, and I used knowledge and, and blah, 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 and all of that. And, you know, and I have started thinking, you know, as a good husband, you know, I want to provide that for my wife. You know, I want to make my wife happy. You know, I have no desire to go to Paris. I mean, maybe a little, but it's not a big deal to me. I've been to London and different places, but as a husband and a father, I want to give to them what other people have. So I made a goal. I said, okay, honey, we're going to go to Paris next year. I'm going to save. So I start planning. 
Because one of my goal was to go to Paris next year, obviously four people, you know, airfare, lodging, food, it's going to take a lot of money. So I said, okay, I'm going to work. Uh, I'm going to work during summer. Okay, I'm going to have to do a little bit extra job here. Okay, and then during winter time, okay, if I work, maybe some English camps here and there, I can save a couple of thousand, you know, save money here and there and so forth. And this is the thing. See, once you set a goal, whether you realize it or not, that's where your, your mind and your thoughts you know, gravitate towards. And without realizing that once you strive after one goal, you are letting go of the other. It is not just about me, but that's how we're made. That's our human nature. And the Bible says it very clearly and plainly. It says, you cannot serve both God and money. Either you will hate the one and or love the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It means that you cannot have but one ultimate goal in your life. Ultimately, if you choose to have two or three, whether we realize it or not, we are going to abandon one in search of, a, of the other. And I saw myself doing that in my life. I saw myself, you know what, you know, I, now I'm getting old. So before I go, you know, I, I want to do this for my wife. And without realizing the things that I plan, the things that I do, the things that area that I spend my time in was toward that goal. And without me realizing it, because my goal was towards that, I was letting go of some of the goals that I set for God. You know, every year I set a goal. I say, God, I pray about a certain number. I say, God, I want so and so many people want to come to know God through All Nations Community Fellowship. Beginning of the year, I say, God, I want... By, you know, end of the year, I want a so, you know, certain amount of people here. Not that it is my ambition, but I know that unless, with, unless I have a goal, I'm not going to, you know, there's a less chance that I'm going to achieve that goal. And when I think about that goal, then everything that I do, not only on Sundays, but Saturdays, and Monday through Saturdays, I do things in related to that goal. But as soon as I started having another goal, I realized that I saw my life gravitating towards this and letting go of my ultimate goal. You know, it is true for all of us. We face this temptation all the time. Again, when you're young, it's easier. But as you get older, guess what? Your goal starts to change. Uh, and I want to be just happy. I don't want to go through the stress of always reaching out to people. I don't want to go through the stress of, you know, you know I don't want to commit to church. Because if I'm a Sunday school teacher, guess what? Man, sometimes I can't go on vacation the last minute. You know, like my so-and-so friend. Man, they just go, that people that don't go to church, man, if they want to at the, you know, at the you know, split seconds notice, they decide they just go to Seoul or they just go to Busan. But for me, I can't because I have Sunday school. And over the, you know, at first, that, it was a privilege and honor to do such a you know, work. But then over time, you start to think, well, you know, maybe I should you know, maybe take it easy. I want to be happy like other people. We think that way. And then as we get older, you know, we make commitments and we have another goal and say, you know what, I'm getting old. I'm going to be retiring in about 10, 15, 20 years. I need to make sure that I have enough money saved up. I'm not saying those things are bad. But we must have one ultimate goal. And we need to make sure that most majority, great part of our lives is focused on, on that goal and everything else has to be a side, minor side note. But as we get older, we say retirement, and then we start thinking about, well, we need to save so and so money. Before we retire, we should at least have a house all paid up. When we have children, we say, you know what, before, within the next 20 years, we need to save up at least 20,000 or 40,000 for our children's education. And without us realizing, when we set that goal, everything that we do in our lives is towards that goal. And as we do that, we let go of the ultimate goal to be holy, the goal that God has set for us and the goal that we set for God. And we start letting that go because of this goal. Again, even just recently, I faced that temptation. I said, you know, you know, I want to give my wife what my friend gives him. I mean, 
he and I were about the same. We went through the same thing. We're both Korean Americans. We speak English. We have a similar education. You know, why is it that my wife can't have what Helen has? Why is it that my children can't have what they have? And as a father and as a husband, you know, I got greedy. And I said, you know, okay, I want to give my wife at least vacation to France. And without realizing, I realized that I set another big goal in my life. But as it happens often in my life, God spoke through my wife. You know, she was kind of a source of the problem, but she was also the source of the answer. Because God spoke to my wife, and when I told, you know, when I, because when I talked to my wife about money, honey, because when, when she spends money, I said, honey, we can't do that. We gotta save money. You wanted to go to France, didn't you? you know? But you know, and then I start talking about money a lot, and, all, and then my wife told me, honey, don't worry so much. Don't worry so much about doing this and experiencing that. Don't worry about saying, you know, wanting this and having that. Because, honey, if you get all the things that you want on earth, then you're not going to get much prize or reward in heaven. And she goes, honey, our reward is in heaven. You know, I appreciate my wife for saying that. But it's so true. You know, she reminds me all the time, honey, our reward is in heaven. And I, I get, you know, choked up because I really appreciate her for saying that. Because not that many women say that. You know, they all say, well, okay, let's go, let's do this, let's do that. You see, the, the prizes and the reward that we get on earth... The Bible tells us it'll pass away. You may own a big house, but you're not, you're not going to take it with you. You may drive a nice car, but it's going to rust and break down. You may make a lot of money, but you know what? You can't take it with you in heaven when you die. All those things, it's meaningless. It passes away. But the reward and the prize that we get in heaven is eternal. It lasts forever. And even this morning when I was praying, I was reminded, you know what my prize will be? My reward will be in heaven, when I get to heaven? My reward will be seeing my family in heaven. The greatest reward I will have is seeing my mother and father and my brother and sisters. The greatest reward I'll have is meeting, hopefully, all of you in heaven. The greatest reward in heaven is seeing people come up to me and say, I am here because of you. And these are the people that I don't even remember. So that is the prize and the reward that I will have in heaven. And I know that if I pursue after earthly pleasures, simple desire to be happy on earth, then you know what? Then I have already received all of my reward. And there will be none left for me in heaven. It is my desire to the day that I die, and for my family and my children, and for all of us, that our goal, that we will remember, that our goal, that the goal that God has set before us, is to be holy, not to be happy, not to be wealthy, not to be a good worker. All of those things are byproduct of holiness. And it is my goal that all the members of All Nations Fellowship have this truth, and live this truth in your lives, in our lives. Let us pray.